Episode 13, Rich Boy Packs Lunch Room 888 was already filled with people. Ken Stokes, a well-proportioned and middle-aged man, stood at the door of the room and chatted with the general manager of the Golden Mansion Hotel. Are you all ready? The general manager bent his body slightly forward and respectfully said, Everything has been prepared according to your directions. The only ingredients for the meals you brought this time were an eye-opener for our hotel. You were the only one in New York who could find so many precious ingredients. Ken didn't pay any attention to the general manager's flattery and simply said, My guest is about to arrive, so go busy yourself. As soon as the general manager left, the long-haired beauty ran in. When she saw Ken, she walked up to him as if she had made a mistake. Mr. Stokes, I'm late. Sorry. Sit down. Ken looked at her speechlessly and sighed. Luckily, Alex Ambrose still hasn't arrived. Otherwise, I would have lost face because of you. She smiled apologetically as she sat down in silence. Ken stood at the door of the private room and waited anxiously. A moment later, Alex casually appeared in the corridor. Ken was startled and rushed over to greet him. Mr. Ambrose, you're here. Come in, come in. After being respectfully invited by Ken, Alex walked into room 888. Everyone in the room stood up. Most of them wore suits and were in their 40s or 50s. They were all upper-class people from New York and the surrounding states. These are all people who work in the East Coast Division. Ken introduced them to Alex and then said to the others, This is Mr. Alex Ambrose. Greetings, Mr. Ambrose, they said in unison. It's him, thought the long-haired beauty. When she saw Alex, her eyes widened in disbelief, her entire body filled with unease and apprehension. Had I just shouted at the family's heir in the elevator? Alex also noticed her, and he hadn't expected that this sexy, long-haired beauty would be in the room. Alex's gaze lingered on her face for a second, before he returned to normal and calmly said, Everyone sit down. Mr. Ambrose, please take a seat. Ken gestured to a seat beside the beautiful long-haired woman. Oh, Grace Carter realized and walked to her seat before giving the long-haired beauty an indifferent glance. She glanced at Ken again. Noticing the questioning look in Alex's eyes, Ken explained who the long-haired beauty was to him. She is the director of East Coast Division's Information Department, Lucy Smith. Lucy looked at Alex with a very bitter, powerless, and dejected smile. It was no wonder that she would laugh out loud no matter how optimistic she was. Mr. Ambrose, please have a taste. I had this dish specially prepared for you, Ken suggested as he placed a dish before Alex. Okay. Alex picked up a mouthful of the dish and put it in his mouth. It was very tasty. It's been more than seven years since I've eaten in such an upscale hotel. This is the first time I've eaten something so delicious in a long time, Alex thought silently in his heart. What Alex did not know was that when the other guests tasted the dishes, their appetites were also stirred, and their hearts were also filled with yearning. The banquet soon ended. Alex had eaten until his belly was full. Mr. Ambrose, have you finished? I'll take you to the Bay Club to rest after you're done eating, Ken asked respectfully by his side. It was rare for the young heir to show such appreciation, so he had to serve Alex well. The clubhouse? thought Alex. No need, Alex said. Lucy had been relaxing along the side of the room after the banquet. After seeing Alex's shy expression, she couldn't help but cover her mouth and quietly chuckle. Alex was so cute, she admired it to herself. Ken nodded, and the others all sat down and looked at Alex without saying anything. Alex looked at the dishes on the table and seemed to be deep in thought. He took out his phone and looked at the time. It was one thirty in the afternoon. Mr. Ambrose, is there a problem? Ken asked worriedly. It felt it had been difficult for him to entertain Alex, and he felt he may have failed. If true and this was spread to the elders, would they blame him? The others also nervously looked at Alex. Inviting their young heir to a meal was no small matter, and they couldn't handle the stress. 
How could a bunch of elites from the East Coast Division have the ability to entertain this young man? No, Alex shook his head slowly. Then you are... Ken was confused. Alex smacked his lips, looked at Ken, and said, These dishes were pretty delicious, so I want to bring some back for my friends to have a taste. Hearing Alex's words, Ken and the others looked at each other in dismay. For a moment, they were unable to react. So, Mr. Ambrose was thinking of picking up some food for his roommates. Isn't this unexpected? thought Ken. A rich, second-generation heir was so considerate of his friends? While the others were surprised, they were also very impressed with Alex. With such a rich family, the absence of putting on airs, Alex would become someone great in the future. Alex didn't understand their point of view. The others looked at him in a daze. He simply pointed at the delicious dishes on the table and said, Mr. Stokes, help me pack this, this, and this. Yes, yes, I'll do it now. Ken nodded as he came back to his senses. As he said that, he had walked to the side of the room and began dialing his phone for the general manager to arrange it. Naturally, the general manager didn't dare to hesitate and ordered the kitchen to make the dishes again with the ingredients that Ken had brought. When all the dishes were prepared again, the general manager added a bottle of good wine along with the food. Half an hour later, the general manager and two attendants arrived at room 888. Each of the attendants carried a blue and white box in their hands. The general manager said, Mr. Stokes, it's ready. Mr. Ambrose, are you satisfied? Ken opened one of the boxes and saw that all kinds of dishes were packed into smaller boxes inside. There's too much. I only have three roommates. I only want one box, so don't waste this. If you can sell it, just sell it. If you can't sell it to your people, just eat it. Alex forced a smile and said, I only asked for three dishes to be cooked. Yet Ken had ordered all the dishes on the table again. Let me help you carry it. Ken picked up the box himself and followed behind Alex. The group of people from the room also followed him out of the hotel. All right, you can all go back now. I'll just take a taxi. Alex said as he looked at the crowd. Mr. Ambrose, I'll take you there. My car is over there. Lucy invited her driver to come out. Uh, sure, Alex agreed. With Lucy escorting Alex off, Ken and the rest felt relieved. After bidding Alex farewell, they all left. As they walked to the car, Lucy started to apologize to Alex. Mr. Ambrose, thank you so much for letting me take you back. It was me in the elevator. She grabbed his hand and said, Please slap me a few times as well. No need, no need, Director Smith. What are you doing? Alex retracted his hand and said, I shouldn't have snuck a peek at you in the elevator. It's nothing. It's my good luck that you saw me. I hope you're not angry with me. I'm very grateful. Thank you, sir. Lucy bowed to Alex as she kept talking. All right, let's just get me back to campus. Alex smiled faintly. Yes, Lucy responded. As they walked, Alex took out his cell phone and called his doormate, Joe. Where are you? I'm still at the hospital in Rose's room, Joe replied. They're still in Rose's room, Alex thought. I should go there now with all this freshly cooked food. Alex frowned slightly and said, What's Rose's room number? I'll head over there now. They arrived at Lucy's Mercedes-Benz G500 as he finished talking with Joe. Mr. Ambrose, please get in, Lucy said sweetly to Alex. Alex first put the box of food in the back seat, then climbed in. Lucy got in on the other side. To Preston University, Mr. Ambrose? Lucy's driver asked. The two of them were alone in the back. Looking at Lucy's smiling face, Alex felt a faint nervousness rising from the bottom of his heart. Let's go to the general hospital. My friend is there, Alex said. Okay, Lucy's driver said, smiling, and started the car. The car was filled with the fragrance of Lucy's perfume. Alex wanted to glance over at Lucy again, but when he saw Lucy's gaze, he quickly turned away. His face flushed and his heart felt flustered. He felt ashamed. Sir, you can have a good look. I won't say anything. Lucy puffed out her chest as her soft voice floated over. Uh huh? Alex was stunned. Lucy glanced at Alex and said, Didn't I say this before? Being seen by you is a blessing. Ah, uh, 
Alex smiled with embarrassment. Since Lucy had said so, there was no need for him to sneak around anymore. He turned in the seat and gazed directly at her. It had to be said that Lucy's figure was incredibly voluptuous. Everything on her body was captivating, including her earlobes, her ample peaks, and her snow-white arms. Alex's mouth went dry, and his face turned red and hot from looking at her. They arrived at the hospital. When she saw that Alex's gaze was still fixated on her, Lucy couldn't help but shyly smile. Mr. Ambrose, we're here, she said softly. Oh, we're here, stammered Alex. Only then did Alex recover his composure. Thank you. I'll be leaving now. He grabbed the food and exited the car. Episode 14, Alex's Poor Box of Food As Alex touched the box of food, it still felt warm, so his doormates could still eat a warm meal. He carried the box into the hospital. Creak, the door squeaked as Alex pushed it open into the hospital room. Rose Scott was staying in a single room. Her injuries weren't serious, so she only had some gauze on her injured leg. Rose's friends were circled around her hospital bed. Other than Joe and a few others, the rest of them were dressed quite stylishly. Beside the bed lay the gifts that they had brought with them. There were beautifully packaged fruit baskets, several red boxes of chocolate, and a few vases filled with brightly colored flowers. The group was talking and laughing, but everyone's gaze turned towards Alex as he came in with a box of food. Alex was stunned by the crowd. He hadn't expected there to be so many people in Rose's room. Alex was originally here to deliver food for Joe, but after all, Rose was injured. Now that so many people were looking at him, he smiled and asked Rose, Rose, are you okay? Rose didn't respond. She just looked coldly at him, as if she wasn't happy to see him. What's that in your hand? Rose's doormate, Stacy Whitehouse, asked as she pointed at the box Alex was holding. Oh, I brought some food over for my friends, Alex said plainly as he glanced down at the box. You can't be bringing food to see Rose, right? Stacy looked at Alex in surprise and said, Coming to the hospital to visit patients with food? Even if it isn't for Rose, they would still... Alex started to explain. Just as Alex was about to explain that this meal was for his roommates, Joe walked over quickly, patted Alex on the shoulder, and said with a smile to the others, Alex is the real deal. We haven't eaten yet. This'll feed everyone's hunger. Alex had come to Rose's hospital room, so if he hadn't brought anything with him, her snobbish friends likely would have ridiculed him. Although this meal was meant for his roommates, now it looks like it was for Rose. It was better to bring food than nothing, right? Alex thought. Ha <laughs> ha, this is the first time I've heard of someone bringing food to see a patient, said one person. I've heard of it before, but all I've seen were patients' mothers bringing food. You're still a university student, aren't you? said another person. A few of Rose's friends started to discuss among themselves. Hey, no one saw you when you came in with this thing just now, right? Rose asked snappily. It was embarrassing for a classmate to bring her food. I saw it, said someone. Alex felt a bit uncomfortable. Don't say that the food was not for her. Even if it was for her, it would still represent my generosity and shouldn't be looked down upon, right? Alex thought to himself. You saw it? How shameful! Rose snorted and turned her head away. Why don't we take a look at what exactly he's giving us? Stacy said plainly. After saying that, she walked over to Alex and opened the box he was holding. Rose's friends started to talk to each other. There's no need to look. What good stuff can you possibly bring? I heard this person's name at university. His family's extremely poor, and he doesn't normally go to restaurants, one said. Another responded, I think I recognize him. He used to be a delivery boy outside of our university, and I've even ordered takeout from him. He delivers takeaway for the small food stalls outside the university. Ah, for those small stalls outside the university, a serving of fried rice and noodles would only cost one or two dollars. Is that box full of fried rice and noodles? Definitely. By the looks of him, even if it's not egg fried rice, 
It wouldn't be worth more than two dollars. Rose needs good food right now. Why bring this? When the nurses come in later, they'll see everyone in the room eating lunch from these boxes. It's only one or two dollars worth of fried noodles. If this gets out, we'll be the laughing sack of the hospital. Rose's friends talked back and forth, ignoring Alex, who was still standing there. A few of them had eaten together at the rookie's lodge the evening prior, so they all knew Rose's attitude toward Alex. Alex was speechless. There was no need for him to stay any longer. He ignored the others and told his roommates to eat their food before it got too cold. He then turned around and left. Rose frowned as she looked at Joe, who was carrying the box of food. Slow down. Be careful not to eat too much. Joe felt a little uncomfortable. But he didn't say anything in front of everyone, so he put the box on the floor. At that moment, the door to the room opened and someone walked in. Rose, it's all my fault. How are you? Is the injury severe? Zane Harrison walked in. His head and hands were wrapped in gauze, so his injuries weren't too serious. It's nothing serious. Just a bit of skin and a bit of a fracture. The doctor said I should be discharged after two days of observation. What about you? Rose said as the coldness on her face vanished, and she revealed a sweet smile. Are you all right? You were in a coma yesterday. How are you feeling? It's all my fault. Sitting behind you. Influenced you. Zane said with concern. Following that, Rose started to show Zane some warmth. Seeing this, Joe and the others didn't feel good. When Alex had walked in, Rose spoke coldly to him. The other people's words were so unpleasant to hear, and they didn't even try to ease the mood. In contrast, Zane caused Rose's injury, but Rose treated Zane so well. Even Rose took the blame for the injury upon herself. However, no matter what, Zane had saved Rose's family's company this time, so it was understandable that she would treat Zane this way. Joe and the others could only let out a sigh. As she spoke, another woman rushed into the room. Rose, what's wrong? How are your injuries? Oh my, look at this arm covered with gauze. What did the doctor say? The woman exclaimed. As the woman spoke, she rushed to Rose's bedside and looked at her in worry. She was dressed in a light blue striped business suit. She had short, neat hair, fair skin, and long, thin eyebrows. Auntie, Rose sighed. Rose's big eyes were shining as she stared at the woman, her small hands already holding onto the woman's hand. The woman that had rushed in was Rose's aunt, Sue Bradley. Although Sue was Rose's aunt, she was only four years older than her. They were more like sisters, so after the incident, Rose had naturally called Sue. The doctor said it's not a big problem. Auntie, don't worry. I'm blaming myself. I should have called you to tell you not to come, Rose said matter-of-factly, looking Sue in the eye. Hearing Rose's words, Sue heaved a sigh of relief. Sue noticed that Zane's head was also wrapped in gauze, so she turned to look at him and frowned. So... You're the one who threw Rose off the motorcycle, right? You said it rained last night? Why were you riding round in the rain? Do you think you're so good on that bike? You got lucky nothing serious happened this time. If something had happened, you would be fully responsible. What Sue said to Zane in front of everyone made him look bad. He coughed and looked around at the others with an awkward expression. And you don't say that to Zane. He didn't do it on purpose. Our recent family matters were settled by Zane's father. Rose pulled Sue's hand toward her and whispered, Zane has helped our family so much. Hearing Rose's words, Sue was slightly stunned. She looked at Zane with a steady gaze and said to her, Rose, are you going to defend him? Of course Sue knew about Rose's recent situation with Donald and Lucille Brennan. When she had heard that Rose had provoked the Heavenly Lion group, she had been extremely anxious, and had sent people to find some connections. However, these connections turned out to be useless because the Heavenly Lion group was too strong. Later, Rose had called and said it had all been settled. Sue was relieved, but it aroused her curiosity. Who had her niece found to settle the matter in less than a day? Sue wondered. Was it this young man in front of her? 
No matter how Sue looked at it, it didn't seem right. Auntie, Rose glanced at Sue with displeasure. Zane's company is not small, and his father had a meal with President Chase. Helping them out is not a big deal. It's rude of you to question Zane. Silly girl, things are not as simple as you think. What sort of status does the president of the Merchant Union have? Do you think you can make a move just by eating a couple of simple meals? Sue is much more mature than Rose, and she had experience with the Merchant Union before as well. She knew that it was not that simple. Ma'am, the solution your family tried was not working, so I asked my father to help. Zane spoke up. Sue had embarrassed him a lot. He continued, When your family was at a loss for what to do, I helped you guys out big time, yet you still treat me with the same attitude. Don't you feel embarrassed? Sue was truly angered by Zane's word. I'm just saying, it isn't an easy task to get President Chase to make a move, Sue said with a dark expression. You still don't believe me? Zane showed a slightly surprised expression and took out his phone. He glanced at Sue with a smile and said, I'll call my dad to confirm it in front of you and Rose, okay? Zane sneered and dialed his father's number. Hey, Dad, let me ask you something. Yesterday, I told you to help Rose with her family's matter. Didn't you go to look for President Chase? He asked casually. Ah, this matter. I forgot to tell you about this, my son. Zane's father replied. I went to look for him yesterday, but President Chase's secretary said that he couldn't see me. It's just that President Chase was too busy at work and didn't have time to talk, so I left a message in the end, his father told Zane. Zane's father didn't know what was going on with Zane, so he told the truth. Zane's heart skipped a beat, and his face instantly felt a little hot. It turned out that it wasn't because of his dad. Episode 15 Rose's Auntie and the Box Yesterday, Rose Scott had thought that her problems were solved because of Zane Harrison's help. And Rose had said that it was due to President William Chase's help so Zane didn't have the slightest doubt in his mind that it was because of his father's influence. Zane looked at the others with a bit of guilt. They were all looking at him and feeling very uneasy. Okay, thank you, Dad. Rose is also very grateful to you, Zane said loudly. With that, he hung up the phone. Zane turned to look at Sue, Rose's aunt. His eyes flickered slightly as he forced himself to calm down. He said, I've checked with my dad. It was my dad who called President Chase yesterday. We solved this problem. Auntie, look, it's like I told you earlier. It must have been because of Zane's help. But you're still so suspicious of him. Rose's eyes showed a hint of complaint. She looked at Zane and smiled sweetly. Zane, don't blame my aunt. She... She's a little too careful sometimes. Why would that be? Don't worry, Zane said as he smiled. Sue was still a little hesitant, and she wanted to confirm this herself. But at that moment, her attention was no longer on Zane. Girl, I came to see you in a hurry. I didn't even eat lunch. I'm starving, Sue said, rubbing her stomach. Aunt, I'm sorry, okay? Oh, right, my friends haven't eaten either. Why don't I order some takeout for you? I'll order some, Rose said to Sue after looking at her friends who had been with her all morning. All right, Sue said. We can order takeout, but I'm, I'm really hungry now. The others all responded. Hey, what's this? Sue happened to glance at the box of food on the floor and walked over. Auntie, don't touch that thing. It's only one or two dollars worth of fried noodles and rice. I'm going to give it to the cleaners later to feed the dogs, Rose frowned. Rose, no matter how much money it is, how can I just throw it away like that? I'm really hungry. Let's eat something first, Sue said as she opened the box. A rich fragrance instantly wafted out from the box. It smells so good, exclaimed one friend. Why is it so fragrant? asked another. What's inside? wondered yet another. 
Everyone in the room gasped in wonder and surrounded the boxes of food. Sue took out all the smaller boxes that were inside and placed them on the cabinet beside the bed. This is Louis the Thirteenth from 1980. She pulled out a flat, round bottle of sparkling red wine. This bottle of Louis the Thirteenth is over six thousand dollars, she exclaimed as the others gawked at the wine bottle in Sue's hand. Auntie, are you sure? Rose looked at Sue in disbelief. No matter what, she couldn't link the six thousand dollar bottle of Louis the Thirteenth with Alex Ambrose. Sue opened the bottle and sniffed, then looked at Rose happily. Really, I've sipped this wine once before when I was on business in France. It tastes exactly like this. She put down the wine bottle. The others had already opened the boxes one by one, and the fragrance filled the entire room. These are Brittany Blue Lobster, Sue exclaimed as she looked at the Blue Lobster in the box. What? What is a Brittany Blue Lobster? The others looked around at each other in confusion. Brittany Blue Lobsters are the world's first choice for seafood dishes in Michelin restaurants. It's a very rare kind of lobster. The chances of it being caught are only one in a million. So there are very few in the country, Sue continued. I often need to eat with guests at work, so I know quite a lot about famous ingredients like this. This is Kobe's steak, Sue exclaimed again as she looked back into the box. Look, this steak looks like a snowflake with fat and thin patterns like marble. This is the most obvious way to recognize a Kobe steak. This is caviar from the Neva River, she went on. This is Japanese white puffer fish. Sue pulled out more delicacies. Hungarian mag ritzer pig. Sue was astounded. Her surprises continued as they took out food items. Oh my gosh, these dishes are all made from top quality ingredients. The taste and price are way beyond that of an average restaurant. To be able to use so many of the world's most rare ingredients, I've never even seen this in a high-class hotel before. Sue's eyes sparkled. Auntie, we've never eaten these delicacies before. Are you trying to tease us? Rose knew that Sue was experienced and knowledgeable, but she just didn't believe that Alex would bring her such expensive food. Hey, do you think your auntie is joking with you? Sue glanced at Rose speechlessly. These dishes are still hot. Let's hurry up and get started eating them. It won't taste as good once it gets cold. Yup, it's delicious, said one friend. It's so fragrant. I've never eaten such delicious food, said another. After eating, the others in the room all sighed with praise. Rose, you should try it too. Susan passed a pair of chopsticks to Rose. Rose hesitantly picked up a piece of Kobe's steak and put it in her mouth. An indescribable taste filled her senses. It was even more delicious than any steak she had ever eaten before. These dishes were simply too delicious. Plus, no one had eaten lunch yet. The dozen or so boxes of food were all polished off quickly. Well, I didn't expect that there would be someone who would give you such fantastic dishes. Sue smiled in satisfaction and looked at her watch. It's getting late. It's time for me to go back. With that, Sue walked to the door of the room, turned to Rose and said, Rose, only a rich person could give you such a rare and expensive gift. These things are not something that can be eaten just because you have some money. Rich person? Could that describe Alex? Thought Rose. After Sue left, Susan walked to Rose's side and said, Rose, it seems that you've misunderstood Alex. I think you should find some time to apologize to him. Me? Apologize? asked Rose. Rose was speechless, but she still hated Alex. Why apologize to him? How could a poor man like that be able to afford such expensive dishes? I think it must be because he worked at some hotel somewhere and brought back leftovers from somebody else's meals. What? Susan didn't expect Rose to say that. These dishes were intact. How could they be packaged? Besides, how could a hotel let employees walk away with a $6,000 bottle of Louis the Thirteenth? thought Susan. The group dispersed after they finished their meal at the hospital. Alex told a small lie and said that he was working in a high-end hotel in the city. 
His boss felt sorry for him, so he gave him the food. Joe and the others asked him again, but Alex didn't say anything more about it. So they had no choice but to give up. After the afternoon class, Alex followed the stream of students out of the building. Alex, a girl's voice rang out from behind him. You haven't watched my live stream, have you? Alex turned around. The girl was Minnie Jones, who ran the live stream that Alex and his doormates were watching days before. I've streamed twice already. I haven't seen you in the streaming room. Hurry up and register an account. Help me see how I can increase my popularity. Minnie pouted and looked at Alex in dissatisfaction. Minnie, what's the use of having him pay attention to you? You can't be interested in him, right? Teased the girl beside Minnie. I just wanted him to make me more popular. Minnie lowered her head slightly and whispered, Why would I fall in love with him? Stop joking with me. It's the same whether you have him or not. From what I heard, he definitely won't help you. He's very stingy. Kathy, Alex's ex, casually said as she walked over from the back. Kathy's right. What's the use of having fans that don't help others? Another girl said from beside Minnie, glancing at Alex. The girls chatted with each other. Last time, that tycoon in your live blog was too awesome. He gave me over a thousand dollars on top of what others had given. That guy was no ordinary tycoon. That's right, I watched it. Yesterday, Minnie made it to the top 300. A host who just started streaming twice can make it into the top 300. Minnie's future is limitless. Minnie, when you become a big streamer in the future, don't forget your good sisters. The girls beside Minnie were trying to win her favor. Minnie instantly became the target of all the girls' flattery, becoming the center of their attention. Kathy felt a little uncomfortable as she stood off to the side. In the past, she was almost as popular as Minnie among the other girls, but now she was being ignored. Kathy's heart was thumping. What's so special about it? Isn't it just acting flirtatiously in the live stream, luring the tycoons into giving her help? If I did a live stream, would that tycoon still be there to help you? At that moment, a black Passat drove slowly to the front of the building. The window of the car was open, and the person driving was a boy from the university. Many students who passed by looked at him with envy. The car stopped, and a casually dressed boy got out. Billy Wilde, Kathy explained in surprise when she saw the boy. Billy, I'm here. Saying that, Kathy waved her hand and ran toward Billy with a smile. Billy grabbed Kathy's hand. Kathy took the initiative and kissed him lightly on the lips. Everyone looked at them. Billy opened the car door for Kathy. Then he got back into the driver's seat and drove away slowly. Kathy looked out the window and saw the envious gazes from the other students. She felt extremely satisfied in her heart. After all, there were only a handful of people who could afford to drive a car in university. Kathy felt that she had gained a lot of faces. It was a good choice for me to give up on Alex, that pauper. It would have never been possible for Alex to pick me up in a car like this, she thought. And today, they even kissed in front of Alex. Kathy felt extremely satisfied. Alex, open your eyes and see what kind of life I will have after I left you. It's a hundred times better than being with you, she unkindly thought to herself.